Well, tonight's speaker is Matt Beckner. He's a relatively new member to the club. He's about a year. He start coming about January. Okay, and he's giving his first presentation tonight. He's a former adjunct professor of physics at Moberly Area Community College in Moberly, Missouri. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Missouri in 2012. He's currently a project engineer in hydrogen storage systems at uh, the GM Global Propulsion System in Pontiac, Michigan. His interest in physics and astronomy began at an early age from uh, watching Star Trek and looking up at the sky, and he's been following the LIGO experiment almost since its inception in 2012. And that's what he's going to be telling us about tonight. Great, hey, Matt. Thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, so when I study physics, I studied uh, materials physics, but I've always had an interest in black holes and general relativity and things like that. So it's uh, it's really not uh, a treat, I guess, for me to come talk to you about that tonight. Uh, something that I don't do every day at work is, uh, is always really nice. Uh, so basically, I'm going to talk about four things tonight. Uh, the first is just a little bit of background about uh, Einstein, general relativity, and, and gravitational waves. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can detect gravitational waves, specifically the LIGO experiment, which uh, the experiment that, uh, I guess you could say, made waves last year when they said that uh, they made it, uh, detected gravitational waves for the first time. Uh, and specifically, then I'll talk about the binary black hole merger, so that particular experiment that they ran where they detected, uh, made that detection. And then just a little bit about what the future is for that experiment and what uh, gravitational wave research might bring us uh, to science. So just like about everything in modern physics, it all starts with Albert Einstein. Uh, Einstein is known for a lot of things, but uh, five major contributions to physics in particular. Uh, the first was photoelectric effect, uh, which is essentially when light hits a metal, it gives off uh, electrons, creates electricity. It's basically how solar cells work, or it is how solar cells work, rather. And this is also the only thing he won the Nobel Prize for was for the photoelectric effect. Uh, Brownian motion has to do with how uh, things float in water, predicting the pathway that those take. Uh, special relativity, uh, which is basically he said that no matter how fast you're moving, the speed of light is always the same. Uh, probably the most famous equation in the whole world, the energy mass equivalence equals mc squared, which I think if uh, nobody in this room has heard of that, I'd ask you where you've been for the last hundred years. <laughs> Uh, and all five of, all, all uh, four of those were in the same year in 1905. And then it would almost seem like he took some time off to come up with general relativity in 1915. Uh, the truth is he actually figured out the basic physics behind general relativity. It just took him a while to figure out the math. And there's actually a really interesting story about uh, uh, the, the competition between him and a mathematician called Minkowski, uh, the race to get that the, the math published. Uh, if you ever want to check it out, uh, Walter Isaacson's Biography uh, on Einstein has a really nice story about that. So general relativity, uh, without going into too much detail, is, essentially says that if you have an object that has mass, it sits in space and the mass causes space to bend. Uh, and essentially, when you have a, an object uh, falling due to gravity, it's because it's following the curve of space. Uh, the whole idea is the more massive something is, the more mass it has, the more it bends space. So the sun will bend in space more than the Earth does. A neutron star, which is, uh, in case you don't know, a neutron star is, is essentially a really massive star that is so big that the gravity uh, is so strong that it actually collapses all the atoms uh, in on each other. So, uh, uh, so that all you have are, are neutrons, and there's no electrons or anything like that. And of course, black holes, which are, uh, you know, a point very, very dense uh, points of, of matter which light cannot escape from. Uh, so one kind of nice thing, even though Einstein was a theorist, at the end of all his papers, he would always uh, propose experiments on how to test his theory. And when he pu published his paper in 1915 on general relativity, he gave three tests. Uh, the first was the prediction of the perihelion precession of Mercury. What is that? OK, so Mercury orbits the sun around the ellipse. And every time it goes around, the ellipse kind of rotates a little bit around the sun. So you can kind of see like this. So we had a problem with Newton's gravity and, and Kepler's laws is, is that when you looked at this precession of Mercury, it didn't quite match what we observed. Uh, so what we had was 
uh, you know, Newton's, the prediction from Newton's laws had a precession of 531 arc seconds per, section, per century. So if you kind of pick a point here, the arc seconds is how this rotates around uh, that. Uh, the prediction from Einstein's general relativity was significantly different, 574. When we compare that to the observed value, we do get 574. So that was the first, uh, or the first test that uh, you suggested. Uh, the second test uh, was deflection of light by the sun. So this was not a new concept either. This was also predicted by Newton's uh, law of gravity, was that as light uh, travels close to a uh, large object, it, it gets bent, so that the you know, there's a difference between where the object actually is and where it's observed to be. Uh, the problem was when you did this with uh, Newton's laws, you got half of the value that it should have actually been. Uh, so the first uh, eclipse that we had in 1919 after uh, uh, Einstein's uh, prediction in 1915, uh, the photographs to observe this, and of course they did find the, the proper angle uh, that, that uh, was observed. Uh, I don't know exactly how they did that, so, uh, unfortunately, I cannot answer any questions about that. Uh, but well, I guess in uh, Walter Isaacson's biography, they do talk about how they do that. I just uh, I don't remember. Uh, the third one was a little bit more complicated, and it took a while for that one to be uh, shown uh, until 1959. Uh, that's a redshift due to of the light due to gravity. It's basically when uh, light is emitted from the sun uh, because gravity is pulling it, it kind of stretches out the light so that it changes the, the frequency and the, the color as you go higher. Uh, so they, they were able to finally show this uh, using an effect called the Mossbauer effect at, I think it was Harvard. Yep. It was at Harvard University in 1959, where they uh, basically had two detectors, one at the bottom of the tower and one at the top of the tower, and they could see the difference in the frequency between the two. Uh, so what is common about all three of these is none of these are very uh, not confrontational. Um, <laughs> what sort? Significant? Uh, no, uh, uh, everybody agrees on them. They're not that controversial. Controversial, thank you. <laughs> controversial. Uh, but what, what was, one thing that was controversial was in 1916, the year after uh, the paper, uh, Einstein's uh, paper on general relativity, he asked the question. What happens to space-time if you shake an object? So, you know, we look at, at the sun in this picture. We have it, you know, just sitting here. We see it nicely warped space-time, at least in this kind of two-dimensional picture or representation we've, we've made out of it. But what happens if you shake it up and down? Well, essentially, uh, you can kind of think of it if, you, if you're holding a string and you shake it up, up and down, you'll make waves on the string. So you should make waves in space-time. But the, what was controversial about it was People weren't really sure if this was actually a real phenomenon that we could possibly observe if it was just a consequence of the new mathematics that Einstein had, had uh, generated. And actually, he, he wasn't sure either. He changed his mind several times throughout his life. Unfortunately, we can't just go out and shake the sun and make gravitational waves and whatever we want and try to detect them. Uh, but one thing that we can do is we can look at objects that are orbiting each other. So it turns out that, for instance, you know, the Earth and the, and the Moon, when they orbit each other, they'll generate gravitational waves that we can possibly look at. Uh, the problem is, they have to be a lot more massive than the Earth and the, the Moon. So even if, if uh, you know, there are two of us and I'm running around, someone in the, uh, in the audience here will generate gravitational waves, but you just, they'll just be so small you won't be able to notice them. Yeah. So what you get is this, this picture kind of like this. We have uh, two objects that are really heavy. Uh, this is a picture that's supposed to be uh, two uh, neutron stars or pulsars that are orbiting each other, and you get these kind of uh, kind of spiraling of waves going out. Uh, I don't really like these static pictures because to me they don't really show you what gravitational waves look like. So uh, there's a really good YouTube video out there. Uh, at the end of the talk, I have the the link down. Uh, I also have my email, so if you don't get it written down and would like to see it, I can email you the link. Uh, but essentially, this is a sheet of lycra, and here he has a he has a drill, and uh, it's attached to a bar with two uh, caster wheels on it. And to give you an idea of what it would look like, it's two uh, black holes or neutron stars are orbiting each other. You get waves that are 
traveling out <coughs> kind of like this. Yeah. I probably watched this for like an hour last <laughs> night. <laughs> 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 it is. Okay, so we're pretty sure that, that from Einstein's theory that there's going to be gravitational waves. So the question is now how we're going to measure them. Well, in 1969, a scientist named Joseph Weber claims that he detected gravitational waves in this giant block of aluminum with these little detectors around here. Uh, pretty much uh, the only person that actually believes that Joseph Weber detected gravitational waves is Joseph Weber. Uh, part of the reason is, is if you look at the prediction and you look at the wavelength of the gravitational waves, there's no way you could ever possibly see a gravitational wave in something this small. Uh, I won't knock Joseph Weber entirely because he was one of the, the contributors to the idea of the light interferometer, which is the basis of the instrument for the LIGO, which ended up uh, eventually did detect the gravitational waves. So I can't say too much about, uh, about Joseph Weber there. Too, it's too much bad about him, rather. Uh, in 1974, uh, we discovered the first binary pulsars. So these are two uh, pulsars of the, there's another name for the neutron stars uh, that are orbiting each other. So now we have the first uh, observed object that could possibly generate gravitational waves that we can actually see. So this was really the catalyst for, to, to get the uh, funding and the experiment in motion. Because uh, before this, it was kind of a shot in the dark. We had no idea if there was, you know, one, if we could even detect gravitational waves, or two, if there was anything in the universe that was big enough uh, to generate them so that we could detect them. Uh, so this was the first, first uh, sort of uh, real concrete evidence that we'd be able to do this. It's more so mass than mass, you mean? Yeah. As opposed to size. Yeah, yeah, mass. I say, yeah, I say size, I mean mass. And they didn't detect the waves, they just saw evidence that the waves must be emitted, right? Well, no, they, they didn't see evidence that they must be emitted, so they, they found the, the two pulsars... Slowing down? Not slowing down, but just that they're massive enough and close enough and orbiting fast enough that they should be able to produce gravitational waves. Yeah, but they saw a decay in the orbit time. That was the Taylor yeah. Pulse binary system. Right, Taylor Hulse? Or Taylor That's Hulse. not what this was. Pulse. Uh, yeah, also. that's a different. That, that was the evidence that there should be gravity waves because yeah. of the slowing down of the right. rotation right. of the okay. two objects. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> long before the headlight, unfortunately. Way much long before. Yeah. So, uh, the funding for LIGO was first uh, approved in 1989, uh, but there was a lot of. Uh, issues with funding and, and uh, the organization of the whole project. So it didn't actually get under construction until uh, 1994 in Hanford, Washington. And the one in Livingston, Louisiana was not until 1985. Uh, they didn't get into operation until 2002. Uh, they operated from 2002 to 2010. Uh, unfortunately, saw no results. Uh, in 2010, they shut down and started upgrading the detectors. Uh, to what they call Advanced LIGO. Uh, advanced LIGO took five years to get up and running and cost $620 million. Uh, but when they were all done, it had four times the sensitivity of the original uh, uh, observatory. Uh, yes. So this is a LIGO light interferometer, which is the type of instrument it is. And the uh, gravitational wave observatory, I hope, is, is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so the point is, there is two observatories, one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, Louisiana, and both are operating right now. Uh, and one important thing to note is that the, the amount of time it takes light to travel from one observatory to the other is about 10 milliseconds. So why is this, this important? Uh, besides that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. Well, if you have two people, and they're standing the same distance from a light source, and you let out a pulse of light, the pulse of light will get there at the same time to each person. If you keep the distance between them constant, but instead put one directly between the source and the other person, you see it reaches one person and then the next. 
So what is important for the LIGO measurement is how much time it takes for light to get between the two people. <clears throat> because if you're seeing a signal traveling at the speed of light at both observatories, it must take less time than this time right here. So when I say it takes like 10 milliseconds to get between the observatories, if you see a signal at both observatories, it must occur less than 10 milliseconds from each other. Otherwise, you're not seeing the same thing. Or you're just seeing uh, uh, some artifact in the data. Uh, here's a nice aerial picture of, uh, of uh, one of the sites. This is the one in Hanford, uh, Washington. Uh, so uh, this is the main uh, instrument here. And you see these two kind of arms coming out here. If you zoom out a little bit, you see that these arms are four kilometers long. Uh, they are so long uh, that actually when they build it, they have to take the curvature of the Earth into account. Uh, it drops about one meter over the four kilometers. Uh, what else? Oh, so the a flat Earth, though. <laughs> yeah, right. There's always one. Uh, so the arms have to be so long. Uh, I had actually thought it was for a detector sensitivity. Uh, but it turns out that the arms have to be so long because of the wavelength of the gravitational waves. Uh, so with four kilometer long arms, you can detect gravitational waves that have a wavelength of eight kilometers. That's the same reason the satellite arrays for uh, uh, greater observatories or observations uh, are so large. It's because of the wavelength of light that you're looking at. Or in this case, the wavelength of the waves. Uh, there are other detectors in the world uh, currently <laughs> operating. Uh, GEO 600 is in uh, Hanover, Germany. That was started operating in 1995. Uh, this uh, observatory was operating at the time of the uh, event in September 2015. However, it's not, it was not sensitive enough to uh, detect that event. Uh, the other instrument that's currently operating is called Virgo. That's in Italy. Uh, it, it was down last September. It's currently being upgraded the same as the LIGO was to get the more sensitive detectors. And that, that would be up, um, let's say it was 2018. No. Uh, there's other future observatories, uh, most of the Kagura. Uh, this is in Japan. This is the, a picture of that right now. So this is down the, the one of the arms. Uh, it's currently under construction. Uh, there's several other proposed ones that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about later. Okay, so I'm going to talk just a little bit about how the, the LIGO works. How basically it works. So essentially, you have a, a laser here, and what happens is the laser emits a light onto a half silver mirror. So the half silver mirror uh, allows you to uh, take this laser beam and, and essentially split it in two. Uh, so in our in our big picture of the LIGO with long arms, that's this portion here and this portion here. And then after it bounces off two more mirrors, it goes back to the half silver mirror where it combines and then goes to the detector. So that's, that's basically the, the path that the light takes, but how does it, how does it actually work? Well, it works on the fact that, that light is a wave. So, uh, so this would be uh, one wave, let's say this, uh, this blue one here, and we're gonna combine it with the, the red wave that's being reflected. It's gonna look something like this. Uh, so once it goes off the silver mirror towards the detector, uh, the detector can't see each of these waves individually. What it sees is the combination of the two. Or the, the, basically, you just add these together to get a signal, which would be this green signal here. Now what I can do is I can adjust the position of this mirror here so that the two waves completely cancel each other out and no signal reaches this detector. So what happens is then, what, what I can do then is I can move this mirror just a little bit and it'll make just a small signal that I can detect. If I move a little bit more, I get more signal, and more signal. So that's the whole basic idea behind the LIGO, is you have a gravitational wave coming come along, and it essentially just shortens the length of one of these arms, and you get a little signal. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Probably a dumb question, but doesn't it also affect the length of the laser to the to the diagonal uh, mirror there? Equally. Oh, you mean this one? No, the, the laser. The distance from the laser. It, it, yes. That, yes, it does, but it, it doesn't. It wouldn't matter. No, that one doesn't matter. It just yeah. it only matters after it's been split. Yeah, gotcha. Because whatever happens to this laser 
yeah. gets whatever happens to the laser here uh, gets split and affects both yeah. equally. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No, no problem. Well, and, it, and it's because the wave is moving, it's affecting, in this case, the way I've drawn it here, it affects this arm, and then it affects this one. Yeah. It's not, it won't do it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that brings us to the actual detection of the, the black hole binary merger. Uh, so this was published uh, this February in Visible Review Letters. Uh, and I was... I always find it kind of funny on projects like this because, you know, this is a project that's been running since 2002, and a lot of people have run on it, worked on it, rather. Uh, so if you look at the list of authors here, the BP Abbott had out with a star, which means somewhere later in the paper there's going to be a huge list of people, and here it is. <laughs> Whoa. Well, I should say, here's the first two pages. <laughs> so you got two and a half pages of authors, and now here's all their affiliations for <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, you get to the very end, you, you find out that actually three people on, on the project actually died since, <laughs> it, since it started, uh, started going. Okay, so this is the most important part of what the data actually looks like. Okay, so for the time being, let's just ignore these, these four down here and look at just the, the top two. So on the left here, this is the data from the Hanford Observatory uh, showing, uh, so the strain here is essentially how far that mirror is moving. And on the right here, this is an overlay between the data from Livingston, Louisiana, is the blue, and the kind of, kind of orange, maybe. Uh, data here is from Hanford, so you can see how they line up almost perfectly. And remember earlier I said that you know, the time it takes for light to travel between the two places is 10 milliseconds. These two little peaks right here were observed 6.9 plus or minus 0.5 milliseconds apart. So they are definitely the same signal. So that answers the first question is, is can we detect a gravitational wave? The answer is yes. We've seen it at two different observatories, so it's not just the instrumentation fluke of one. Now the, question, the, other, the next question is, well, is it actually a binary black hole merger? I think claim it is. And to answer that, uh, you have uh, the model here, which is this uh, the red curve here. <coughs> uh, so this is what uh, general relativity would predict from these two particular black holes merging. And the difference between the two is down here. And it's, it's essentially zero. So I guess this is one thing I always uh, try to tell my students is, you know, when you have uh, data like this, what the data says is that a mirror is moved. So you have to have something, uh, I would say, more concrete to, to describe what you're, you're saying. Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, is I'm, trying to, I'm trying to show that this actually was most probably a black hole merger. That as far as we know, there's nothing else that could have caused this. That's what I'm trying to say. So a little bit about the, the theory uh, and how they got this, this curve, just because it's a little bit interesting. So uh, the data out here uh, towards the very beginning, which is just this stuff out here, which is completely lost in the noise of the signal that we can't actually see uh, here. So this is, this is the, what they call the in-spiral. So the two black holes are, are spiraling at a, a distance that's too scale to the map here, uh, orbiting at 15 times every second, moving around. Uh, as you go further down the signal, uh, we get to where it starts to uh, get a little bit larger. Uh, they start to speed up, get closer together, and start orbiting at about 250 times per second. Uh, so there are two black holes uh, that uh, this model that, that fits the data showed. Uh, one was 29 solar masses, one was 36 times the mass of the sun. Uh, and uh, once you get to the, the big peak in the signal, this is where they actually collide and you use, lose uh, about three solar masses of energy is given off this, as uh, gravitational waves. And of course that one is, is nicely given us, from, given us to us from uh, equals mc squared again. Thank you again, Einstein. Uh, and then once you get out here, then you have the, the new black holes form with a, with a new mass. 
Okay, before I talk about the consequences, are there any, any questions that maybe I can possibly answer? Were those black holes the scale and the previous? No. <laughs> I don't no. Think so. no, they're not even scaled to each other. I just kind of I mean, I the other one. Go back one more. Yeah. No, they're not even scaled to each other. Maybe because that circle on Detroit would be probably the right scale. Well, um, no. I mean, for the size of the black hole. And for the size of the black hole, it's a point. So it's smaller than an atom. But uh, for the event horizon, I can't really say. OK, so uh, consequences of the, of the LIGO in the future. Uh, so in June 2016, they did observe a second uh, black hole merger. Uh, that one, the, the model showed, was 14.2 uh, solar masses and 7.5. So a little bit smaller, uh, but they were still able to see it. Uh, they're also proposing uh, new detectors, which I said I talk about a little bit more about later. Uh, there's several that are, are still proposed uh, that are working on funding. Uh, one in India, uh, one in uh, China, a second in Japan. Uh, probably the most ambitious, I would say, is this ELISA proposed by the European Space Agency. Uh, that one they're actually planning to put in orbit. Uh, so you can kind of see this would be one of the, the, the mirrors that would be reflecting the, the laser around to detect the gravitational waves. And that was, uh, that was pretty neat. Uh, last. Last is important future questions that can be answered by uh, gravitational wave research. Uh, first was, do black holes exist? Which is kind of an odd question to ask because we talk about black holes so much uh, that we kind of take for granted that uh, they're actually for real, but honestly, our observation of black holes has only been from gas surrounding black holes. There's never been a direct observation. Uh, so the answer to do black holes exist? And really now is yes. Uh, the, the black hole merger from the gravitational waves is really the first direct observation of some black holes. <coughs> uh, do gravitational waves actually travel at the speed of light? I want to make sure I get this one right. Uh, so this is important for reconciling particle physics and general relativity. Uh, so what you would do is you can compare the detection time of the gravitational waves. Uh, so if you have more than two observatories, if you have three or more, you can determine where the gravitational wave is coming from and how fast it's, it's moving. Uh, if it's actually traveling at the speed of light, uh, then that tells us that uh, particle physics and uh, general relativity are, in fact, uh, agreeing with each other. And the gravitons uh, don't have mass, just like photons, uh, or just like light waves. And uh, on the other hand, if it turns out that they do travel less than the speed of light, then that means that the gravitons, which are in particle physics, are supposed to be the particle that uh, transmits gravity. Uh, so if, if the if they do travel less than the speed of light, and that means gravitons do have mass, and we have to really go back to the drawing board on particle physics, which uh, I know a lot of people would definitely not like to do. Oh, this is a good one. Are neutron stars rugged? Uh, so remember I said neutron stars are, are really dense. And uh, one thing is, is we really don't know a whole lot about neutron stars. Uh, I had a professor uh, at uh, Western Illinois University, and uh, he was studying he was a theorist uh, trying to study how uh, neutron stars farm, form. And even most of the questions anybody asked about neutron stars, he just went, I don't know. Uh, but this question is interesting. Are neutron stars rugged? So the thought is that they're perfectly spherical because the gravity is so hard, so, so high. Uh, but some scientists uh, think that they might be rugged and have mountains. But uh, the definition of mountains is a little different. When they say mountains on a neutron star, they mean a couple millimeters, not, uh, not uh, Mount Everest here. So the idea is if it's not perfectly spherical and you observe uh, gravitational waves from a neutron star, that you know, it'll be a little bit different if you have that little couple millimeters. Uh, I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, what makes stars explode? Uh, so that has to do with supernova, supernovae. Uh, which we don't really completely understand how that works uh, exactly. Um, so yeah, looking at the gravitational waves produced by the super, supernova may help uh, explain how they are 
uh, how it happens. Uh, and the last one is how fast is the universe expanding? Uh, so basically, uh, if you observe neutron star mergers with uh, several different uh, uh, observatories, uh, gravitational wave observatories, again, it has to be more than two. Uh, you know, you can look at, uh, you can compare that with the uh, redshift of the stars uh, from optical uh, telescopes to see, to independently verify how, how far the, how fast the universe is expanding. And that is uh, all I have. Uh, there's two books about Einstein that I, I uh, always recommend to people. Uh, one is Walter Isaacson's uh, biography of Einstein, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, I have an audio book. It's always a lot easier. So it's, a, it's a really, it's not complicated, but it's long uh, to read. Uh, another one is uh, it's called E equals MC squared uh, by David Bodanis. Uh, I read that in uh, my first year of college. Uh, that always really stuck with me. It uh, has a lot of stories about how each part of the equation comes together and then how Einstein put it all together. Uh, again, I have uh, uh, the YouTube video here uh, if you want to check it out, or you can always email me. And I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Matt, yeah. just a comment. Mm -hmm. I read I read about Einstein's life, and I remember reading that. When he published, I think, his special relativity paper, mm -hmm. it sat out there in the public for like a year. Nobody responded to it at all. Some people thought it was because they didn't understand the mathematics, but Max Planck That's read it. Right. And Max Planck was a world-renowned German physicist. Yep. He actually said, pay attention to this guy. Yep. He knows what he's talking about. He's the guy. And all because of that, People started reading his papers. So the amazing thing to me is he wrote this, and it was like death silence. <laughs> Nobody paid any attention to it until Max Planck said, hey, read what this guy has to say. Yeah, I, uh, and then that solar <coughs> eclipse that Arthur Eddington took that photograph of, yeah. that's what I think made him world-renowned famous. Because yeah. it proved yeah. concretely that you know the public could see, ah, this is something strange, and he explained it. Yeah, and really, yeah, you're right. The uh, solar eclipse was really the first, yeah, that first time that uh, kind of made a world famous. Yep. Yeah, even uh, all the papers. And yeah, special relativity is kind of hard to test on its own. Yeah. Uh, although at, at the end of that paper, also he gave a couple of experiments. Oh, I can't, I can't recall what uh, exactly they were. It's been I, I know there were some failed attempts to do that solar eclipse <laughs> photography because of World War One. Yeah. Some people were able to do it, the weather didn't cooperate, whatever. Yeah, they tried to do it in Africa. Bunch and, uh, of events, yeah, a bun yeah. bunch of attempts, but Eddington got it. Yep. Um, I, I, I mentioned this to you before your, your talk, um, that there's some theory that, in fact, it may not have been two uh, black holes, or it may have been a magna star that was actually in, contained the black holes within the magna star of some, some renown. That may have been that that that, that makes this work better than the two black holes. Okay. Uh, there was some some several reports on that that that, that came out that were that, that may have been the object itself both times. Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't seen that paper. I mean, I mean, being a physicist as, long, as far as seeing comparing an experiment and a and a model, it really doesn't get a lot better than that. Yeah. So I would. Be surprised to see a model like that that would be better. I but I mean, it could be. I don't know. I'm not gonna say it is because I've never I haven't seen it, so I don't know. Yeah, I think I. Um, I kind of have a love hate relationship with the whole <coughs> sheet weight thing. Yeah, tell me. So because it, it's missing a dimension. If you're thinking three dimensionally and you're seeing these waves, is there any kind of directionality to it as far as is it better to have like a, a planetary transit, it's got to go in front of the, what if you were above these two black holes, would that change? Great question. I always think the thing, same thing. Would yeah, that change question. the signal? Oh, yeah, so if you're at the, at the, at the like directly above the, yeah. uh, yes. uh, not epicenter, uh, the, uh, Merger, very center, center of mass. Center of mass. Thank you. Yeah, if you're directly above the center of mass, I don't think you would see the waves. Okay. I so think there, there is I think some be sort of directionality to. I would think there would be. Yeah. That, that's a good point because I've always wondered the exact same thing. Yeah, because I mean, 
with just one star, you can orbit it any way you want. So right. the gravity goes out and all I mean, I can see how there would be some directionality because there's a directionality to their orbiting each other. But I was curious whether. So, but if are we able to tell? based on the wave intensity, whether we're looking at this thing inclined or edge on or... That's a good question. I don't really know. Um, I mean, I, I would assume you see the easy ones first, so right. that would probably be just if we got lucky and saw an edge on strong signal. Also, am I right in assuming that uh, the, the LIGO detector is just the right size where we can now see the, these are the high intensity waves and the, those are actually the shortest wavelengths so far. So that like less intense mergers have a longer wavelength that we can't detect. Less intense. That has to do with the, the sensitivity in terms of they they bounce the laser back and forth to fold that path, you know, sort of the way the castle grains do it. But there's going to be a limit on how much that stretch like, can be. Yeah. So if you had a, if you had a smaller it. detector, you'd have to have a higher intensity right. wave to be able to detect it. Right. And therefore, oh, have a <laughs> that's why the advanced the four times the sensitivity. Right. That was able to see it. With four times less sensitivity, you probably couldn't see. Yeah. 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 Uh, first of all, excellent job explaining this. Thank you. I thought it was very well done. Yeah. Number two, I'm I'm trying to think of the mechanics of the LIGO system and the setup. Obviously, they need two LIGOs because any little vibration, earth tremor, anything would move these very, very sensitive mirrors. Correct? And I'm trying to think of what, I mean, these mirrors have to be so sensitive to move. So Help me out here. You can, you can actually count. So this is a, these kind of interferometers is not a new idea. Uh, they've been around for 100, 110, 115 years. Uh, invented by a couple of scientists called Michelson and Morley. And they were looking for a uh, the ether. the ether, exactly. Yeah. Um, so when they did their first experiment, they were worried about those vibrations too. So actually, they floated their instrument in a giant pool of mercury to take out those uh, vibrations. So you can you can uh, account for stuff like that so that uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, affect your experiment. And they, they do that in this too, not with mercury, but uh, uh, they have a. So you're saying they stuff. could do the same experiment with one LIGO? And no, how, you can, yeah. yeah. But, but again, how would they determine if it was an earth tremor, for example, versus a gravitational wave? I but you, can, you, can, you have a, a seismograph and you compare it to, you, you so check to make sure there's no... plugged in for various yeah. events like earth tremors. So they're yeah, checking against that to say, wait, wait, we got a tremor on the seismograph, so are we getting a signal on that? Oh, no, ignore that one. Yeah. That's a tremor. But again, that's the advantage so of having two. trucks driving by. So what happened was really there were two trucks, one in Louisiana and one in <laughs> right. that happened to hit the same <laughs> six, six, six fuel holes. holes. Right. <laughs> six holes per second. They've got, and they've got the two L shapes mm -hmm. angled differently, right? Because if, they, if the wave came in and they were both pointing the same way, they would both, both stretch. I mean, well, so the L is there so that unless it comes in exactly 45 degrees in, Right. Both legs would stretch the same, same way, time. and you wouldn't see it. Right. But that way, you you point your other leg, your other L, the other way. Yeah. So, so you don't. Uh, if it hits this one at forty five, the other one won't get hit. Right. right. So the yeah, I don't know if they. I, I can't say they actually did that though, because I'm not sure. Oh no, no they, are, makes, they, they are. They are angled. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They are. So, yeah. I mean, don't you want them to have the same signal so that you can compare the times? No, no. Look, what, what you want is let's let's say on the L like this, if it came in directly along the diagonal, yeah. you get no signal right. because they both. So put your other L a different way, so that this, well that would, I mean. But 90 degrees to each other. Uh, they might be 90 They gotta degrees. be 90, because then. Well, either way, which, if you come in if you come in on the diagonal, you don't get a signal on this detector. So who cares what happens with the other detector? Because you need the confirmation of the two. To Google. But so the 10 milliseconds <laughs> between 
means we and it's less than 10 milliseconds. So isn't there sort of a cone of this is where those things could be based yeah. on the timing? So we need to know, I know it's that location to say, oh, here's the speed of that wave. Right? Because right now we say, well, if we assume it's speed of light, here's our cone of possibility. Sure. Yeah, that's why you need three. Yeah. But if you get the three, yeah. then you go, oh, one, two, three, oh, it's there. It's got it oh, right there. Now yeah. I can know the timing. Exactly. Right, okay. So if the Earth is rotating, so it scans the universe. It yeah, is, but we, but we still have the, it's only two detectors here, so along that line, we can say the wave came in sort of angled like this, but we have to assume the speed to say it was, it was out there, but where out there? Could be well, anywhere it, out here to give us that. And it doesn't have to rotate. It'll detect a gravity wave through the Earth. Well, yeah. yeah. And the, the speed of the rotation of the Earth is slow enough that, uh, and the uncertainty in the time difference between the two detectors that you wouldn't even notice. Correct. Okay. So when the advanced Virgo comes online in 2018, is it going to be that third that's going to allow for the pinpointing of it's the location? Because it looked like the two experiments were pretty had a lot of cross pollination on the on the research there. Yeah, yeah it's supposed to be just as sensitive. Advanced one any more sensitive than the first two? The advanced LIGO or the yeah yeah the advanced LIGO is four times as sensitive as the original. But the advanced you you indicated the advanced Virgo was going to be roughly with the capability of LIGO in its current state. As far as I know, yeah. These black holes, were they located inside of a galaxy? Do you, do you know where these black oh, holes are? Oh, I don't know. I don't know where they were. No, they only know because there's only two of these instruments right now. I saw a map of where the, the waves could have come from. It covered a big area of the sky. So they just have them here. Detected. Well, they only have two of these detectors, so. And then which know angle in a general can't way where the signal came from. They can't say it came from that galaxy. They can't triangulate it yeah. to yeah. yeah. right. It's sweeping out. Yeah. What it's doing is it sweeps out of the object. You can get larger and larger and larger if you want. If you want to talk about the yeah. waves themselves and, and another planet, the Earth somewhere in that direction gets the same thing. They're measuring it. So there's no way uh, they can know ahead of time uh, what the uh, 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 the rate of uh, you know how fast they're orbiting around each other or anything like that. They just know by you know when they by the change in the waves as it happens. Yes. And then analyze it later. Yeah, that will change in the future. When the Europeans get their system up in space, it'll have enormously great if it works. It'll have such uh, like a million kilometers lengths. So, and, and extremely high sensitivity. So they will be able to detect <coughs> much fainter signal and much longer wavelengths. So when these things are spiraling in, where they still have a long way to go, uh, they'll see it coming. And then these existing detectors will only detect the last fraction of a second. But, but they'll know it's coming. They'll be, have more uh, uh, preparedness at that time to yeah. analyze just what it where it comes from, what it is, and you know, more information about it before it happens. The interesting thing with that, with the high sensitivity, is going to be pretty noisy out there. There will be a lot of stuff starting to spiral in. Yeah. Once they can once they can hear that, we only heard a really loud burp out there. So once it starts spiraling, you're going to have signals from all over the place overlapping. In, in fact, there. there is hope. <coughs> that, that space-based uh, system may be able to detect some of the remaining rumbles from the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. uh, are they able, so they can't get a direction, but can they tease out a distance based off of the signal? Like, you know, they, if they interpreted the sizes of the black holes based on the rotation rates, they should know the intensity of the wave, and then based off of what they measure, can they? Do we know at what rate gravitational waves dissipate, or no? Yeah, I mean they dissipate just like a right. Does so can part. they? Do, was there anything said about what they think? Yeah, yeah, not that yes. I, not that I remember. Yes, they said yeah. the first signal they detected was 1.3 billion light years away. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's got to be that one. Yellow. 
It's in the abstract, I think, that you had up there in one of your slides. Yep, uh, 410 megaparsecs. <laughs> yeah, which is something like 1.3 billion light years. There's a lot in that abstract. It's a good abstract. Yeah. And it's, it's relatively easy to read. Right. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm to the yeah, I mean, if you, have, if you know what a strain is, then it's not too hard to guess what a gravitational wave strain is. <coughs> yeah, it says the event's es estimated to be a one event per 203,000 years. So we've got to wait that long for the next event? The next one at that size. So that's the false alarm rate. Oh, sorry, there you were. Right. What? False alarm. Once every 200 minutes. So. In other words, they're saying their signal could be just a fluctuation in their data, but the, the, this fluctuation they saw was big enough that random error would only give that in both of their detectors once in every 200,000 years. In other words, it's not a false alarm. Okay. Probably. Nice to know. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, and they got good. the masses of both black holes, and they got the missing mass of about three times the mass of the sun. Um, I mean, it's amazing for just having those two sensors mm -hmm. how much they got. Yeah. Well, I mean, the only thing that the sensor really gave is the, is the strain here. Everything else is from the model, right? All the black hole masses, the, how much was radiated is well, But they, they got the strain, the rate of change of the signal at time, how yeah. long the signal lasted, the <coughs> amplitude, yeah. and the, the shift in timing between the two. Yeah, that's true. And the phase, uh, the phase angle between the two. Yeah. So these things are on all the time. And there's constantly information uh, signals coming in, and it's just when they, they detect something like this, then it gets all its attention. Yeah, and they're not on all the time. Uh, they have to shut them down for maintenance and things like that. But they are on, yeah, a lot of the time. They How go long through, was uh, this running before uh, they detected this? Just a couple weeks. Weeks. Yeah, they started like at the beginning of September, and this was September 14th. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Pretty lucky. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, they already got two hits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe more by now. Yeah. Mm. Because when they announced it, didn't they have a second hit that they suspected? Right. Yeah. Then there was another one in June. Yeah. Like. So yeah. That's a third. Yeah, and they waited until this was accepted for publication. Of course. Before they announced it. <laughs> <laughs> Which was good. That's a lot better than what they did with the. Uh, I said. Or the uh, the. Neutrinos that were traveling faster than light in Switzerland. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oops. Whoops. Don't forget the cold fusion. Yeah. Uh, they, they, it's not cold fusion anymore. It's it's excess enthalpy. And people still do that research. Talking about the expansion of the universe, speed of it. What about it? You were talking about that briefly. You didn't really... Oh yeah, I did a little bit. Um, yeah, that was the last thing I talked about. I don't really understand exactly how that works. Uh, Honestly. Is the expansion of the universe greater than the speed of light? That's what the question is. Oh, is it greater than the speed of light? Yeah. I, I do. That's way outside I of my brain. I can't answer that either. Yeah. I'm saying that the, mm -hmm. It's a speculation that maybe it is, and if we could capture that, maybe we can travel places. If you, if you do not travel in the space-time continuum, <laughs> the theory is, and there are credible scientists saying that, yeah, you could probably exceed the speed of light. The, the, the problem is, if you're in the space-time continuum, 
that Einstein's relatively, uh, rel relativity applies, right. that you cannot exceed the speed of light. Right. But to be superliminal, to be above the speed of light, if you can somehow create a warp bubble and warp space-time continuum in front and behind you to propel you, then yeah, you could. That's what they say. You know what? I've done warp bubbles in Kerbal Space Program here, and they're problematic. You uh, it takes a lot of energy to make. <laughs> well, them. you come out, you come out next to the planet, and your speed is is not similar to that planet, and you come to a stop, and that planet goes <laughs> by you. So well, then, one of the problems is how do you stop? You have to have that. That's why the Enterprise has reaction drives on it. Because <laughs> 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 boy, isn't Gary Ross isn't here? <laughs> We're almost to the point of no return. That's why. That's why you need inertial dampeners. Otherwise, you're, that's right. Oh, you're God, I hear Jerry now. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions not related to the USS Enterprise? <laughs> Yeah. Any questions related to the USS Enterprise? <laughs> I actually do. A friend asked me what is full impulse, and I don't know. Does anyone know what full impulse one, speed one, is? One light, uh, uh, it's moving a little, uh, just sub, uh, sub light, light speed. Yeah. 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 Full impulse is just sub light speed. That's all it is. Someone asked, someone asked me, I don't know. It's not, it's not more I guess, I do, but if you really want to know the answer, uh, there will be a meeting by a guy named Chu. <laughs> okay, all right. This sounds like a kind of conversation better directed it to the national Yes, but it should be uh, just one single pulse. Oh, yeah. Oh, or it would be half a wave. It basically be, uh, it should be half a wave, I would think. So half a wave? Yeah, it's like if you took a, if you took a string and just went down, you'd get half a wave. Theoretically, if a black hole went by at a tremendous speed in a straight line, would, would we be able to detect a ripple in space? I can model that in Universe Sandbox and show you. There's hardly any effect at all. Depending really? On the speed of it. Yeah, I would think it'd be pretty small. I think there's like a big all right, so I think that was presentation gravitational waves that we all could uh, digest. So after astronomy, we traditionally do gastronomy, of course, the National Coney Island of Van Dyke, just north of 12 miles. Yeah, well, the, this one is large. Um, so if you do want to talk about whether it's uh, black holes or impulse power, yeah, warp drive and impulse power, um, head on down there. Um, and if not, we will see you in Cranbrook or at discussion group at our place on the 20th. And one of the topics of discussion is going to be pinpointing where everybody is going for the solar eclipse next year and determining how to wassify everybody's events. Because we have flags, we have banners, everybody has gear. We want to represent wherever our members are going. We're gonna we're gonna start the ground plan for that at discussion. Hanging on my question table. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, my baseball caps. Bring the baseball.